Hey everybody, it's Shaman Sister Sin, and you're listening to the Meditations and More podcast. That's me, the little shaman. In today's episode of the show, I would like to address a question I get asked pretty frequently, and that question is, are narcissists and psychopaths evil? In today's society, it's very common to hear the term evil thrown around, but what does that really mean? If you ask five different people, you'd likely get five different definitions. For the purposes of this discussion, we're going to use evil as both a noun and an adjective. So, for example, we would say that a demon is evil in both sense of the word. A demon engages in evil behavior. A demon is an evil being. A demon, therefore, does evil and is evil. The word both describes them and defines them. Psychopaths and pathological narcissists often engage in evil behavior, but are they evil beings? Can people really be evil? The word evil used to conjure up visions of devils and demons, but now it usually brings to mind a more human breed of evil. We could call that evil in the real world, such as serial killers and things like that. More than one psychologist has just flat out stated that some people are evil. They're born evil, and they stay that way until they die. Nothing will change them or make them better, uh, largely in part because they don't want to be better. Evil is the only way to describe a person that psychology cannot explain. Jeffrey Dahmer is one such example of that, serial killer Jeffrey Dahmer. There were no terrible incidents of abuse in his childhood, no severe head injuries like we often see with other serial killers. His brain was actually examined after his death, and it was found to be perfectly normal. That was at his request. There is no real scientific explanation for Jeffrey Dahmer or his behavior at all. He was a mystery, psychologically speaking, to science and even to himself. Dahmer stated on more than one occasion that he did not know why he was the way that he was or what made him that way. Narcissists and psychopaths aren't usually overflowing with personal insight anyway, but it's pretty rare for anybody, even a narcissist, to have absolutely no idea why they did something. Now, you might look at that and say he knew why, but he didn't want to tell, but Dahmer was actually a very forthcoming type of a person. He wanted to talk about it because he wanted to understand, because he himself was able to offer no explanation at all. There are some murderers whose eventual behavior can be, maybe if not predicted, at least foreseen. Like we can look at a history of abuse, abandonment, and neglect and say, okay, I can see how this person could become a killer. Dahmer does not fit into that mold. All things considered, he really shouldn't have become a serial killer. But he did, and nobody knows why. Dahmer isn't the only example of this phenomenon, He's just a better known example, and his atrocities are generally common knowledge, but he's not the only example at all. So how does that happen? There could be two explanations for this phenomenon, one scientific and one spiritual. Science defines evil as the absence of something, and spirituality defines evil as the presence of something. So if we are defining evil as the absence of humanity as sciences want to do, then we could explore the idea that because psychopaths and narcissists are largely empty inside, this empty space needs to be filled up with something, and what they fill it up with is stimulation. As they're also really, really damaged individuals, both narcissists and psychopaths are consumed with the concept and the idea of power. Many of them were severely abused as children, and the idea of having power is very important to them because they seek to counter an entire childhood or maybe even a lifetime of feeling like helpless victims. They were taught that the way to have power is to hurt other people. Therefore, the idea or process of achieving power is very important to the type of stimulation they'll seek. When the innate cruelty of the narcissist and the psychopath is added to this mix, you have a very dangerous individual on your hands. According to this definition, which is the definition that evil is the absence of something, psychopaths and pathological narcissists would be considered evil because they lack humanity. They lack many things, in fact. Empathy, a conscience, insight... 
This theory is mostly sound as far as it goes, but for the people who don't have histories of abuse, it just doesn't make any sense. We can easily see how most narcissists and psychopaths are created. It's understandable that someone who's abused would spend a lifetime trying to get over it or striking back against it any way they could, and it's understandable that constantly hurting or humiliating a child will create an adult who is very angry, who has no empathy toward other living things, whose emotions are not fully developed. So it's therefore correct to assume that it's both nature and nurture which generally create the psychopath and the narcissist. Because without the perfect storm, so to speak, of both environment and predisposition, people generally don't become psychopathic or pathologically narcissistic. What about the others, though? The ones who don't seem to have been created but born that way? How do you explain that? Because these people do exist and we don't understand why. Now, if we're going to look at the other side of it, and we're defining evil as a supernatural presence, as spirituality is wont to do, then we could explore the idea that because psychopaths and narcissists are basically empty inside, something malevolent and evil simply moves into the empty space and begins exerting influence over their behavior and their lives. The narcissist and the psychopath have malfunctioning defense mechanisms, and they are inherently weak. They would be an ideal target for a malevolent energy or whatever, you know, you would want to call it. They are also less capable of insight and they're extremely susceptible to distorted perception, flattery, and appeals to their vanity. This can make them relatively easy to manipulate or trick, another thing which would flag them as ideal spiritual targets. And lastly, most narcissists and psychopaths are disproportionately preoccupied with power, so this can sometimes result in them dabbling in demonology and similar things, which would make them more likely than others to blatantly invite a dark energy into their lives. A person with no absence within them might not be affected by messing around with something like that, but the psychopath and the narcissist are way more susceptible than regular people. The spiritual theory of presence, though perhaps unlikely to many, would seem to explain a few things that science cannot, including the curious phenomenon of psychopathic children. This brings us to the born psychopath. Now, science does not allow the labeling of these children as psychopaths. They cannot be considered psychopaths until they're adults. But this has no bearing on reality. They are psychopaths, and they appear to be psychopaths since birth. It's important to note here that there is no history of abuse with these children. Studies showed that the parents of these, quote, cold children, as they're called, are as involved and loving as the parents of normally functioning kids. The difference is the cold child does not respond as the normally functioning child does. The cold child does not recognize or care about the love that he's being shown. It, it just doesn't interest him. That is psychopathic behavior. The cold child displays sustained rages, continual aggression, calculated violence, calculated cruelty, even at like four and five years of age. He doesn't fear consequences or social ramifications, whereas most people might think, if I'm a mean person, others won't like me. You know, that has no effect on the psychopathic child. He is remorseless and lacks empathy completely. Now... We could argue that children of that age don't necessarily understand empathy anyway, and most people probably would argue that. I certainly would argue that, and I wrestled with that over this question. But the truth is that the behavior of these particular children says differently. Calculated violence and cruelty display an active, conscious intent to cause harm. This means the child understands their actions are hurtful and that being hurtful is the goal. This is both an acknowledgement and a rejection of empathy. The child obviously understands empathy and chooses to reject it in favor of causing harm. Why? Because he apparently understands empathy, but he obviously does not feel it. These children have no emotional empathy at all, but as they mature, they develop the ability to simulate or fake interest in people's feelings, sort of like what we could call cognitive 
empathy. They can say what other people feel and they recognize it after a fashion because they're intelligent. They just don't care. They understand intellectually that people have feelings, but that's as far as it goes. Other people's feelings have zero value or meaning to them. This is identical to the way adult narcissists and psychopaths behave. The manipulative and calculating behavior seen in these children also generally far exceeds what a child their age should be capable of engaging in. Now, there are many scientific theories for why these children exist at all, and most involve hormones or genetics, but as of yet, none of these theories have panned out. The current theories do not explain why some of these children do such terrible things, though, while others don't, and certainly... Hormones and genes don't even come close to explaining how a child under 10 years old is able to reason and calculate as if they're an adult. Perhaps science is just not going to be able to explain that. So if, as we said, science defines evil as the absence of something and spirituality defines evil as the presence of something, you would think that this puts the two theories at odds But does it? Something can only establish a presence in an already existing absence. This means that the spiritual theory actually fits in with the scientific one perfectly, and it's quite a bit older than its scientific counterpart. In order for something to fill a vessel, the vessel must be empty. You cannot pour more water into a full bucket. The scientific community generally stops short of considering a presence of any kind, but does acknowledge that evil exists and admits that evil cannot be explained by science, at at least not currently. Perhaps it's a mixture of the two, rather than one or the other. The nature versus nurture debate raged for years before both sides gradually came to the realization that both nature and nurture contribute almost equally to any psychological situation. There are more things in the universe than can be explained or even experienced, and science readily admits this as well. It's not such a hard leap, then, to theorize that perhaps in the absence that exists in the narcissist and the psychopath, something else might come to be. According to the scientific definition of evil, the narcissist and the psychopath are indeed evil.